This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech here on a given Thursday. Welcome to a show we call Bigotry in America on Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today, it's an important show, and we call it The Incident in Davis, California. We're going to talk about apologies and acceptance across communities and our American community and how it needs to change and how we must all participate in dealing with hate in this country. If you want to ask a question, make a comment, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-734-2014. Our guests for the show are Gail Rubin, a retired attorney, and Shireen uh, Kudosi, did I pronounce that right? She's the director right. of um, Muslim Matters with America Matters. They're both joining us by Skype from California. Welcome to the show, Gail and Shireen. Thank you very much. So there was an incident in Davis, California, and in other places, um, and uh, it was uh, statements made by an imam in a sermon or a speech in his mosque. Uh, and we want to talk about what he said, uh, what motivated him to say it, uh, whether he was alone or with others, uh, you know, in this, in this statement, um, how the communities, that is the Jewish community and the Muslim community, reacted to his comment, <clears throat> and the apology he made, and the acceptance of that apology by the Jewish community. We want to hear about um, you know, what this means in terms of those communities and the views of those communities and how they are likely to deal with it going forward. So uh, Gail and Shireen, thank you for being here. Uh, let me ask you first, Shireen, if you could tell us what happened in the mosque uh, with Imam Shaheen. Yeah, so this summer, uh, Imam Amr Shaheen from the Islamic Center of Davis gave a one-hour sermon on calling for the apocalypse against the Jews. And this is not just in Davis, this is elsewhere. This has happened at least two other times around the same time frame in California. He gave a one hour speech, the mosque defended him. They put out a statement in defense of him. And after one week of pressure, including launching a petition, including support, uh, getting the support of local elected officials like Brad Sherman, getting a bit of media coverage, the community finally came forward and he apologized for his statement. But when he apologized, he had the entire uh, interfaith community used as props behind him. And the apology, which I use very generously in quotes, was pretty much a statement about how he's been a model for the community. But his one hour speech is really indicative of where he stands in the interfaith community and where he stands as a Muslim and where he stands as an American Muslim right now in the landscape, which is very charged uh, politically and on racial lines and religious lines. So this is unacceptable in my eyes. Yes, well, what did he say? What are the words, what are the thoughts that he expressed in that speech? The general language that they have, that these, that these individuals have, and I'll let Gail add to it too, I've covered this with other imams that have toured in Europe, that these imams travel from country to country, and we have them homegrown here. Their language and their rhetoric is very apocalyptic, and, and I use that full knowledge of what that means. That means that there will never be peace for Muslims until Muslims fight with the Jews, that the last day will call on Muslims fighting with the Jews, and that until we get to that point, there will be no resolution, whether it's in Palestine, which is the issue that kicked off his sermons, whether it is uh, Muslims living abroad and else, elsewhere in other parts of the world. And so it's very violent. It's very hateful. It's it's uh, completely anti-Semitic. But I would say I would go further than anti-Semitism. I would say it's full out Jew hatred. Yeah, and he said something about uh, annihilate all the Jews one by one. And in your article that you wrote, I want to talk about that. You called it a statement of genocide. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely genocide. And so these people, someone like Amar Shaheen, he's not a, a man of faith in the sense that we would envision someone of faith to be. These are propagandists who have access to the pulpit and they use theology to uh, to prostitute the faith that they say that they're from. So this is this is a serious problem in my eyes in California and elsewhere. So how did it come to your attention, Sh Shireen, and uh, what did you do about it? Well, so what happened is it, it made the headlines, and of course it didn't make enough of the headlines as much as it should have. And I was speaking with a colleague of mine who, who informed me what was going on. So the minute I heard his sermon, which again was up for a week, and now Memory is the only organization that really still has parts of it up, 
I was really enraged. For when I worked with Counter Jihad, I covered um, Uriah Makbul, who's another hate preacher, and his sermon, hour long again, calling for the annihilation of all Jews, saying that there will be no peace until we kill every every Jew and we fight with them. It's it is so deeply offensive to me as an American, and more importantly as a human being, as a person of faith, that we we are calling for genocide against an entire people under the banner of God, and that is unacceptable. So what I did is I launched a petition with change.org to call for his removal and call for, um, put pressure on the mosque board. Ultimately, an imam is not going to step down without community reinforcing him, and the people who really have control over whether an imam comes or goes is the mosque board. And so I don't expect him to be taken down because these communities are far too insulated. There are other solutions that we can talk about, but it is important for Muslims to stand up and and do what we can from within our own faith. So the uh, the, the takeaway from your article is that, uh, the article you wrote, is that he, he needs to be removed. Uh, from his position. He needs to be fired, terminated, what have you. Um, did you get a, you know, I, I mean, my reaction, my reaction to that was you're pretty courageous. And a lot of people who wrote comments on your article said the same thing, that you're pretty courageous. Did you get any, uh, any feedback from the Muslim community, from extremists in the Muslim community? You know, I'm really glad you asked me that because the people who messaged me are the Muslims who want to who want to stand with me publicly, but they can't because the, in a post-Trump era, for example, Muslims aren't afraid of a travel ban, quote unquote, against Muslims. We're not afraid of Trump. We're not afraid of even white nationalists. We're afraid, first and foremost, about what our own community will do against us if we speak out. So I had a good ton of Muslims message me privately supporting it. Uh, they weren't always able to sign on board because of, of the backlash they would receive in their own community and how it affects their income and their business and and their their, their own sort of standing in the community. But they are supportive of it. They, they're tired of this as well. Mm-hmm. Jay, can I jump in here? Yeah, I think Gail, perhaps I wanna, it's I important for your listeners you to aware, actually hear verbatim the words about. that were spoken by Imam Shaheen. May I uh, quote them now? Is now a good time? Yes. Thank you. So um, he spoke um, two Fridays in a row, Friday, uh, July 14th, and again on the 21st. And he repeated essentially from the same hadith. And before I quote it, it's important to know that this hadith is also incorporated into the Hamas charter. Hamas, as we know, is a designated terrorist organization that seeks the utter destruction and annihilation of the Jewish state. So this, these are the same words, and I quote, he quoted, O oh Allah, he's invoking the name of God to liberate us from the filth of the Jews. O oh Allah, show us the wonders of your ability that you inflict upon them. Show us the black day and count them one by one and destroy them down to the very last one. Do not spare any of them. Do Destroy them and do not spare their young or their elderly. O oh Allah, turn Jerusalem and Palestine into a graveyard for the Jews. Now, I think all um, people of, of good faith and goodwill would, would agree that the, this kind of language does not belong in any civilized society, and most of all, not in a house of worship. And the fact that he is, has misappropriated a house of worship to utter these despicable, murderous words, we should all be outraged. And I am a Jew, an American Jew, and I live a mile away from this mosque. And this mosque is also located directly across the street from the University of California at Davis. And a large percentage uh, percentage of students at UC Davis attend this mosque. Um, That should be of concern to everybody. Why? Because now, If students are inclined uh, to become radicalized, of course, we know the internet is a a large source, all they have to do is walk across the street and listen to Imam Shaheen. Well, you uh, caused to be made a movie of this, uh, and I'm interested in seeing that movie. If you don't mind, uh, Gail and Shireen, I'd like to play that movie now and see see what you revealed in that movie and and what kind of... uh, reaction you had from the local community. So let's play the movie now. 
اللهم أشغلهم بأنفسهم وأرنا فيهم عبرة وآية اللهم أهلكهم بددا وأحصهم عددا ولا تغادر منهم أحدا اللهم دمرهم تدميرا ولا تغادر منهم صغيرا ولا كبيرا The Prophet says that the time will come the last hour would not take place till the Muslims fight the Jews and we, that, we don't say if it's in Palestine or other till they fight and when that war breaks that they would run and hide behind every rock and house and wall and trees the house and the wall and the trees will call upon the Muslims I want to stand against hate speech that calls for the destruction of the Jewish nation the Jewish people it has no place in America it has no place on this planet So this happened uh, in July, and in August, uh, we had the, the reaction and this protest that we're seeing now in the movie, right? Uh, yes, that uh, vigil was held at our local uh, park uh, on a day where there's a, a lot of people attending the local farmer's market. Um, we, just as a group of concerned citizens, felt compelled to speak out why. We felt that our elected officials and self-appointed leaders did not do the right thing to protect us. Um, Within a week after the video went viral, and by the way, it was the mosque itself that posted its videos, its pattern and practices that every week post its sermons. Mm -hmm. And so for one, one should um, be concerned that they are so out there and, and uh, unabashedly posted this on their own website. Um, that's important for people to understand. Um, so what initially happened is um, representatives from the mosque and CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, um, doubled down and tried to blame the victim, saying memory, uh, the outfit that uh, translated the uh, Arabic portions, uh, misconstrued or misquoted, and um, then no, they were called to task, and then uh, the mosque began its apologia uh, process with its handler care, and that's another issue. Council of American Islamic Relations mm -hmm. um, operates throughout the U.S. and poses as a civil rights organization protecting the rights of uh, Muslims in America. But in fact, they themselves mm -hmm. have radical um, ideology and tendencies. Um, Within a week after this sermon was revealed, there was a closed, carefully controlled press conference where the imam was told to read an apology. He apologized for hurt feelings, but he never took back the ideology. Um, he never said he was wrong uh, to have that ideology, and he knows exactly what he was saying. He's very schooled and learned in this particular form of um, radical Wahhabi Salafist ideology. You know, I, uh, I remember that uh, his apology was based, that's the end of the movie, that his apology was based on uh, his passion. He said he was driven by his passion, which I thought was a very interesting justification for the statements he made. Um, because he didn't apologize for his passion. You can't change passion. And I guess his passion is the anti-Semitic passion. So this was an apology, at least in my view, that really didn't go anywhere. What was the reaction of the Jewish community? Well, that's also been a very interesting issue, uh, which uh, really there is a crisis in the American Jewish community that's been going on for so time because uh, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, as Jew hatred has ramped up, um, there has been quite a crisis on how to deal with it. So um, the, we have what's called the Jewish Federation in Sacramento, which represents essentially our region. And they wanted to quickly show harmony and good faith with the interfaith community and work with CARE and the imam to um, massage and create this apology. But I will tell you, the average Jewish citizen on the street doesn't buy it yeah. and is very concerned, as, as am I. 
How about you, Shireen? Do you buy it? I mean, was this a legitimate apology? It sounds like it was done behind closed doors. It sounds like it was negotiated. And in any event, it, 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 it deferred the issue about whether to terminate him. Uh, how do you feel about this apology, the negotiated apology? The apology was a joke. It was not an apology whatsoever. I, I wish we had the opportunity to, in, to engage that apology. And I'm actually really embarrassed for every single person in that community, within the interfaith community, and within the sort of civic community who stood behind this imam and listened to this apology and allowed themselves to be treated as as props in this in this apology, which it was not. It was it was shameless. It was scripted. It was um, it was it was very intentionally crafted in order to appease whatever sort of backlash they were getting. But the, the right approach to this would be to remove that imam, 100%. And that's, that hasn't happened. I don't think that's going to happen because there isn't enough pressure. Jay, what I found really shocking is I tried, Gail and I and a few others, we tried so hard to bring media attention onto this, including, I'm going to out them, Californian conservatives who championed the issue of, you know, being uh, against Islamism. But when it's at their doorstep, I had hardly anyone do anything. They had the opportunity in our own backyard and nobody uh -huh. cared. Two weeks later, we I wake up on a Saturday and I see the Charlottesville rally and I see all this media attention go towards the KKK and, and the BLM movement. But this entire larger issue of apocalypse and calling for Armageddon within houses of worship was largely ignored. And it is a failure of, of the Muslim community. It is a failure of the media. And, and I thank you for giving us the opportunity. And I thank Gail for what she did. But it is just, we're so outnumbered and outresourced uh -huh. here. One other thing before we go to our break, Shireen, you, you created a petition. And you circulated the petition online. You got as much extension on it as you could. And uh, as I recall, right now, you have about 5,000 signatures on the petition. Uh, what does it say and what does it mean? It calls out the imam for what he's done. It says that he he does, has no place in a place of worship. He is a propagandist. He is prostitute, prostitution. It's a prostitution of faith. So the other thing is it's not a matter of uh, assigning blame to every single Muslim who walked to the mosque doors because they're there to listen to a sermon. And so not only did he give this sermon, not only is the mosque board responsible for what he said, but he also took advantage of every single worshiper who walked through those doors. And so for the three reasons outlined in the, in the change.org document, he has really no place as a, a leadership role within, within the house of worship. How can I sign me, the petition? Where do I go? Yeah, if you can go to change.org and if you actually, if we can share the link after the show, that would be fantastic. But if you go to change.org, look up in my, Abma Shaheen, and or my name, and it should pop up in the search bar. Okay, we're going to take a short break, you guys. We come back. Uh, I want to talk about how this is repeated in other places, in California and the country, uh, the effect of the Trump administration on this kind of bigotry. And I want to ask you what can be done, both from the Muslim side, the moderate Muslim side, uh, and from the Jewish side, and from the, the side, all other sides, in order to deal with this kind of bigotry and hatred. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah uh, this is the starting line. Push. Uh, uh, when this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. We're back. We're back. This is Bigotry in America on Think Tech here on a given Thursday. Our guests are Gail Rubin, uh, who is Jewish, a, a retired attorney in California in Davis, and Shireen Kudosi, uh, who is um, 
the director of, the, of Muslim Matters with America Matters, and she's a Muslim person. Um, and they've both written articles about the incident in Davis. And uh, during, our, uh, during our break, uh, Gail was talking about, uh, you know, a very ironic situation where the Jewish community was, was helping this particular mosque. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about that, but then I'd like to go forward to a, a discussion of what's happening in California and the country in general. So what happened in January? So in January, this very same mosque was vandalized uh, by a woman, a disturbed woman, um, obviously a hate crime, obviously despicable. We don't do that to our, our houses of worship. Windows were broken and some uh, bacon was wrapped around a door. You know, that's um, uh, forbidden uh, under Islam. And um, hundreds hundreds within after this incident came to the park, the interfaith community came together, showed support for the mosque, did fundraising to help repair the damage, etc. So now come forward six months later and their very same mosque and leader and clergy calls for utter annihilation of the Jewish people and we didn't see that reaction. We did not see support in the park. We did not see the interfaith community come and, and rally behind us. Instead, they colluded to do a hush-touch apology and let's move forward. And that includes the mayor of Davis and the city council and the board of supervisors. Um, and um, we all know that words can't kill. We all know the words that started under Hitler. We all know the words that started from uh, Mao's little red book and how many millions were murdered. And so the irony, which is a bitter pill to swallow, is there's a clear double standard, as Professor Alan Dershowitz writes about often, when it comes to Jew hatred. There's a double standard. Um, because if you replace those murderous words with kill every black or kill every gay man, uh, rest assured this Davis community would have been lobbying for him to be fired. That's very, and very the funny. other issue, just real quickly, is we have to look, why is this imam there? Because there have been issues uh, that there is no real board in control or anyone to go to. And that's because this mosque was built, funded, and the imam placed under the aegis of North American Islamic Trust. I encourage your listeners to Google North American Islamic Trust. They are an endowment with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, with ties to Hamas, and they purposely build and install radical imams like uh, Imam Shaheen uh, in communities to test the waters. And what's most alarming is you see Davis is has the ignoble distinction of being rated among the top 10 anti-Semitic campuses in our country. And now we have Imam Shaheen right across the street. Yeah, and servicing a lot of kids, a lot of students out of that campus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, there are other, uh, by the way, I wanna, I wanna offer you the opportunity uh, to, to make comment on that, Shireen, because you were talking about that during the break. Yeah, you know, I my sympathy goes out to all the different sides who are who are affected here, the worshipers and then the interfaith community and the civic community, uh, such as the mayor of Davis and, and the larger interfaith groups. And the question is, these are groups that want to engage Muslims and they don't know where to go to. So they make the mistake of thinking, well, the mosque is the representation of the Muslim community. And the fact is that there are fantastic Muslim civic and business engagement opportunities with, with rising Muslim leaders, with rising Muslim uh, spiritual gurus, guides, uh, speakers, organizations that are progressive, and even just Muslim businessmen and businesswomen. So going to the mosque is not always an accurate repre representation of the Muslim community as a faith group or even as a voting bloc. There are other places that they can go to. And to do that, all you need to do is, I mean, anybody is welcome to call me up. Uh, I can give them access to a few other people and have a conversation about what are your goals, what are you trying to do, is this mosque or is the mosque in your area the best place to go to in order to outreach with Muslims? And and if you feel it is, then maybe there needs to be some sort of middleman. So let's take a look at San Diego, for example. San Diego's Republican mayor, Kevin Faulkner, recently partnered with CARE, which should be so obvious that you don't partner with CARE solely on, on a on a one-to-one -one basis to launch a Muslim Appreciation Week. And so rather than reach out to 
uh, myself or Muslims for Progressive Values or oh, or Anila Ali or Surah Yadin, who are all in California, in Southern California, the default they go to is either care or it's the mosque. And so this like this sort of loop and the cycle of um, Islamism continues, which is which is really ironic because on the one hand we put up memes and 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 prayers when you know when we're attacked by terrorists, but when those the terrorists in suits, when the ideology is carried through a different channel, through a different door, we sit there and we partner with them. And these people are not, they're not on our side. They're not mm. going to work with us in the way that we need them to work with us. Now, you mentioned earlier, Shireen, that there were other similar incidents. There have been recently, this year, other similar incidents in California where other uh, imams have made similar statements. Uh, can you talk about that? And you, can you talk about what was done over it? Yeah, uh, absolutely nothing, really. So if you go to gatestone.org and you just Google my name in Gatestone, there is an article that comes up, and that article mentions one other individual, and that individual was in Riverside. So there's one there, and there was one in L.A. So mo both of these imams had the same rhetoric, and again, this was the issue in response to uh, the, the situation that kicked off in, in, in Israel on Temple Mount between whether... Uh, Muslims had access to Temple Mount, which they absolutely did. And so rather than look at the larger context of what happened, the security was clamped down in Israel because of the attacks and, and, and more killings. The, the default Muslim position has been, well, they're not giving us access to a holy site, which is a whole other issue, which in my opinion, as a Muslim, Muslims and Jews both need to have access to that. So what we do back at home is we take those issues, rather than look at the number of atrocities that are happening in the Muslim world at the hands of Muslim dictators and Muslim uh, tyrants, we, we hyper-focus on Israel, and Israel is sort of the boogeyman, and, and which, is, which is the issue that comes back at home. We take it into the mosques, and we, we politicize our own houses of worship. And so, and then we complain when, uh, when, the, when the administration looks at Muslims and looks at the Muslim community as a political or as a racial sort of uh, a unit. When groups like CARE come in, when groups like, uh, you know, interfaith communities that come in that are not interested in the genuine well-being of the Muslim community, which means being the tough parent, which means challenging our community from within. Uh, this is a sort of a, a cycle that just perpetuates itself, whether it's the Islamists, whether it's uh, civic leaders, whether it's the interfaith community, whether it's the media. And, and I don't see an end to this. The only way I really see it is people like Gail, people like yourself, people, uh, you know, who are doing the individual work mm -hmm. so that we can challenge this on some level and create some waves. Gail, you know, uh, I can't remember uh, this kind of thing happening before. Maybe it has happened, but I can't remember it. I d haven't seen it in the media. And, and I am thinking that um, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. And, and I wonder if you feel that, um, that bigotry and anti-Semitism along these lines is more now than it was before. And I'm interested also in your thought about whether the things the Trump administration has done and not done makes, makes uh, anti-Semitism and bigotry worse than it was before. What, what's your sense of the, the direction, the arc of all this? Mm -hmm. So I've been active, very intimately active, in working to push back against um, Jew hatred, which manifests in code language such as anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism, boycott, divestment, sanction movement, basically against all things Jewish, which you know, is rather ironic. We don't even rank as a full 1% of the world's population. <laughs> and uh, the sovereign nation of Israel is about the size of New Jersey, and about 19 Israels would fit into all of California. So be that uh, uh, as it may, as context, um, there has been growing Jew hatred in the form of Israel bashing on our college campuses that spill into our communities almost for the last 15 to 20 years. And it has been ratcheting up. Campus officials have been failing to deal with it. I have been directly involved in trying to defeat uh, several BDS actions in my region and in my community. And it has been growing and growing and growing. So from my personal experience, it's a false narrative and a false equivalency to say it's because of Trump. And I make no judgment, pro or con, about who is our president or, or, or not. I'm just stating a fact that that's a false equivalency um, as we see this ratcheting up, definitely. Because you know what? 
if you call out white supremacy and violence, you're brave. But if you call out Islamist supremacy and violence and genocide, then you become a racist. Mm. And that has been going on for quite some time. Yeah, this is of great concern, Gail, great concern. And we will follow it in here in this show, Bigotry in America on Think Tech. But I wanted to get uh, suggestions from you and Shireen both about what your respective communities could do to deal with this, to ameliorate it in some way, um, to, to clarify how people think and, and deal with other communities. Uh, so let me, let me start with, with you, Gail. What's your suggestion to the Jewish community? How does the Jewish community, that includes me, how do we deal with this kind of anti-Semitism which might otherwise just be growing on us? Right. Um, education, education is the key to so many matters. People seem to not want to become educated even if you uh, steer them to the sources. Um, and that's disturbing because we know education is the road to peace, truly. Um, if you see suspicious activity, report it, right? That's what we're told to do. Go to Homeland Security, go to the FBI. Um, but most importantly, and I'm going to speak from a legal standpoint, um, we and, and others, we know Congressman uh, Brad Sherman and our local Congressman John Garamendi, who spoke out against it, did make requests, as did the Simon Wiesenthal Center, as did the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, for the FBI to investigate. Because on its face, this is a pattern and practice issue, which is an important uh, jurisdictionally, um, that it's not a one-off thing that Imam Shanheen did. And so we have state civil rights laws under both the Ralph and Bain Civil Rights Act, and we have federal laws um, with regard to incitement to genocide or coercion or, or har harassment of a protected class or a minority group. Now, the question is, and that's why we went to our city council on August 9th, we said, city, your first task is to see, keep us safe. Your task is to uh, maintain uh, the public trust of safety. We want you to take this matter to the U.S. Attorney's Office, to the District Attorney, to the FBI, and have an investigation, because we know one thing at least. This mosque and imam has used the resources of the internet to incite genocide. Now that is definitely subject to prosecution under federal law. So why are we so soft and complacent? Yeah, well, I think the important thing is you're talking about it, Gail. You're here on this program and other programs. You're writing about it. I compliment and admire both of you for having done that. But let's, let's close with Shireen now. Shireen, what's your advice to the Muslim community? Uh, what would you suggest to them in order to ameliorate what is a, really an awful problem? Well, first, I'd want to—I really want to thank Gail for what she just contributed. I think that's so smart, and it's—it's it's so astute, and it's a lot of work that's gone in on her part to do the work that our own communities should be doing. And when it comes to the Muslim community, you know, we are trying really hard. There is an entire subculture of Muslims. Uh, of, of progressive Muslims who are trying to create a niche. It's mostly online. We're now trying to move that niche and that online subculture of progressive values towards uh, some sort of physical space, whether it's meeting in public or whether it's coming together in some sort of real time. But to the civic community, to the politicians who are looking for the Muslim vote, to the interfaith councils, I urge you stop working with people who are not working in your interest. Start reaching out to different people who, different Muslims. There are Muslims in every city. You can reach out to me. I will help you find someone who is truly progressive. Empower them, work with them. And that's the next generation of leadership that we need. That That's my goal right now is to multiply some version of myself or better so that tomorrow there are thousands of us and we're not just some, you know, one one candle in the dark. And so that's what we have to do, whether it's the Muslim community or whether it's the, the non-Muslim American community is empower new leaders because the ones you're working with aren't working in our interests. Thank you, Shireen. Shireen Dosi and Gail Rubin, I admire and respect and, and thank you both for appearing on our show. And um, uh, this is uh, Bigotry in America on Think Tech, and it's really been a very important discussion. Aloha to you both. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.